Family, a prayer that we pray together is a powerful prayer. So please pray together with me our EWTN family prayer. Today we pray for those who govern us. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you who are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For your reign will never end. We pray for all of our government leaders. Give us, O Lord, men and women after your own heart. Reverse the tide of immorality in our land and raise up godly men and women to govern us. Through our leaders, protect life from its conception, safeguard marriage and family life, and grant us freedom of conscience. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood. Do this in memory of me. the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace and peace of our Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us ask God to show us his mercy and forgive us our sins. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, a virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. Draw near to your servants, O Lord, and answer their prayers with unceasing kindness, that for those who glory in you as their creator and God, you may restore what you have created and keep safe what you have restored. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the tribes of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people that escaped the sword have found favor in the desert. As Israel comes forward to be given his rest, the Lord appears to him from afar. With age-old love, I have loved you, so I have kept my mercy toward you. Again, I will restore you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. <clears throat> Carrying your festive tambourines, you shall go forth dancing with the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. Those who plant them shall enjoy the fruits. Yes, a day will come when the watchmen will call out on Mount Ephraim. Rise up, let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. For thus says the Lord, shout with joy for Jacob, exult at the head of the nations, proclaim your praise and say, the Lord has delivered his people, the remnant of Israel. Verbum Domini. The Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. The Lord guards us as a shepherd guards his flock. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it on distant isles and say, He who scattered Israel now gathers them together. He guards them as a shepherd his flock. The Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. The Lord shall ransom Jacob. He shall redeem him from the hand of his conqueror. Shouting, they shall mount the heights of Zion. They shall come streaming to the Lord's blessings. The Lord will guard us. Then the virgins shall make merry and dance, and young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will console and gladden them after their sorrows. The Lord will guide us to the shepherd of our
Dominus Vobiscum. Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matthäum. At that time, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, the Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not say a word in answer to her. His disciples came and asked him, Send her away, for she keeps calling out after us. He said in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage, saying, Lord, help me. He said in reply, It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She said, Please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. Then Jesus said to her in reply, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. Verbum Domini. I'd like to begin with this reading from the prophet Jeremiah, from chapter 31. And even our psalm response is from that same chapter. It continues it on. Normally we have something from the book of Psalms, but not here. It's uh, ch chapter 31, verses 10 through 13. And there are a couple things to understand. When you read the Old Testament prophets, you always have to understand the historical context. So saying words that made absolute clear sense to them because they were there. And they knew the circumstance. And as we have been hearing over the past couple weeks, these various readings from Jeremiah, he had begun prophesying in six, uh, well, right around uh, 621 or so, early on in the reign of Josiah, when Josiah, uh, 627, that was the year, 627, when Josiah was just in his majority, he was a little boy when his father was assassinated. So he was raised up, and Jeremiah finally started to prophesy as another young man. They were both young men. And Josiah listened to Jeremiah, brought reform, things improved. But then his son was as thoroughly a fool as Josiah had been wise not the first or the last time in history that ever occurred. And his son, especially Zedekiah, just kept vacillating, couldn't make a decision about what was right and wrong. He would set the slaves free and then re-enslave them, all at Jeremiah's insistence. All these things had gone on and finally, after they just showed themselves unable to listen to the critiques of Jeremiah, especially about their false worship and false trust in the temple. Remember those passages where he was criticizing their worship in the temple because they thought, well, the temple of God is here. Nothing bad can happen to us. Nothing will go wrong. 
because the temple is here and God will save us no matter what we do. Mm, Jeremiah said, that's not true. It's not true. If you continue to sin and continue to go against the very nature of the worship God calls you to, go against the morale because you see as a theme throughout the Bible, especially from Exodus, when they leave Egypt and get the Ten Commandments, if you are going to worship, you have to be morally right. God won't accept worship of those who flagrantly break his law. And that is a theme that continues all the way into the New Testament when St. Paul says that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that some of you are receiving the Eucharist unworthily in a state of sin. And that's why some of you are sick and some of you have died. It's the same theme that improper worship is not something that the Lord will say, it's okay. If you're in a state of sin, you have to correct your life and bring it under God's moral order before you come to worship. That's the principle. And what we see is that the people of Israel at the time of Jeremiah would not do that. They reveled in their sin, and they thought they were just safe. They, in some ways, they used the temple like a good luck charm. It's the way some reckless drivers have a rosary over the rearview mirror, thinking Our Lady will protect them. They haven't said that rosary, maybe ever. They just hang it up there to protect them. And they might need to do a little bit more than that. Again, as I always tell drivers, praying your rosary as you, you drive is a lot better thing to do with your fingers than what some of the other drivers are doing. So this is something that they were uh, sinning in so many different ways. And finally, in 587, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was burned down. And all the sacred vessels were taken off to Babylon. What they couldn't carry, they broke into pieces and then carried. But they brought all those sacred vessels. The temple was destroyed. And one of the most beautiful buildings in the Middle East brought down. Now, a temptation of so many people is to say, see, I told you so. I told you, if you would have listened to me, then you would have been fine. But no, you wouldn't listen. So you got what you punished. This is your just desserts. Um, that's not what Jeremiah said. After the destruction, that's when this is written, probably either late in 387 or into the next year or so. He starts prophesying comfort and promise to the people. Because at the same time that it is necessary to have moral uprightness in the way we worship, the Lord's committed love to us remains absolutely firm. And it's just like something every parent knows that you need to discipline your children to make them stop doing not merely naughty behaviors, but sometimes behaviors that are very dangerous, playing in the street and things like that. You have to discipline them for their own good as well as your own sanity. And so this is something you do, but it doesn't mean that you hate them forever. It's always a good idea after you discipline them to then go ahead and show them comfort. That's exactly what Jeremiah is doing here, showing comfort. And so the Lord says, 
at the time of the total destruction. I mean, picture the city that had very secure walls that withstood the, uh, the invasion and destruction for a couple years. The Babylonians had to wait before they could finally conquer the city. And what we see here is that at that time of smoldering still going on, he said, the Lord says, I will be the God of all the tribes of Israel. Now keep in mind, the northern tribes had been destroyed about 135, 136 years earlier. The northern tribes and their capital had also been burned down and was not rebuilt. And the Lord is promising, I will be the God of them too. That's why you see uh, a number of times that he refers to the people of Israel and to the mountains of Samaria. Samaria is in, was the capital of the north, and it's on a mountain. Also, very well fortified, very difficult for the Assyrians to take. And the Lord has not forgotten them either. He wants to save them from a long time ago, as well as the people of Judah. And he says, with age-old love, I have loved you, with ancient love, I have loved you. That that love of God is in his very nature, so much so, we'll see later in the first epistle of St. John, chapter 4, that St. John will make that proclamation that God is love. It's his very nature to love. And that's something he cannot and will not change. And in this comfort, he, Jeremiah speaks for the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the people that escaped the Lord and have found favor in the desert. The ones who escaped the sword are those who were inside the city and didn't get killed. And the grace they found is that they survived the destruction. Now, this is a, an important picture to consider. That they may well be tempted to look at survival. It would have been better if I had been killed too. Because now I'm being taken off to Babylon. And they had to walk. And the only way to go there, it's far enough by any standards, but they had to walk all the way up through Syria and then come down, go up to the north, because there's no water straight east. So you had to follow where the water was and take that long route, walk all that way, and they might think, oh, this is awful. But both Jeremiah and Ezekiel see their exile as a time of purification of the people. And that they will both call, and uh, we'll see as we get starting on Ezekiel, who had gone into exile uh, about 11 years earlier. He was with the first deportation. And both he and Jeremiah will say that this is a purification that will get you ready to be a remnant that can come back and bring restoration. Because restoration of the, the country is going to happen. That's one of the things he says. I will restore you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. And notice how he speaks of Israel as virgin Israel. Why? Because going back to the prophet Hosea, the Lord had revealed that he loves Israel as a groom loves his bride. And Jeremiah picked up on that a number of times. When he was criticizing them, he said, you are like an unfaithful wife. You are committing adultery by worshiping these other gods, something that Moses had said back in Exodus 34, to worship other gods is zonet, to 
commit adultery. But it means if that's adulterous, then the worship of the one God is fidelity to your spouse. And again, this is a very important idea. It gets picked up by our Lord Jesus, who describes himself as the bridegroom of the church. And he continues this not so much with old Israel, but the new Israel is the Lord's bride. All the way through the book of Revelation, the second coming of Christ is described as a wedding feast. And this is the roots of that. That picture, that understanding of our union with Christ being like that of a bride restored to love for her spouse, for her husband. That's the image that Jeremiah uses here and Hosea had used and Christ will use all the way through the end of Revelation. And that we will, it's interesting that this psalm that we have is a series of verses that the Lord commanded. Most of the psalms we see come from David or some of the other authors who celebrated. Here, the Lord speaks through Jeremiah to command, you will be singing and rejoicing. He even gives the words of rejoicing. To, as he says, to hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and proclaim it, that he who scattered Israel now gathers them together. That's why this continues on. And the Lord wants all the nations to know this because ultimately he is going to bring the nations into the church and unite them with himself. And that they too, like is the case for most of us. Most of us come from non-Jewish background. And our Gentile background is part of the Lord including us in that gathering, in that rebuilding. So that even in this gospel here, our Lord said, I came for the people of Israel. He had to take care of them first. The promise had been made to them. So he had to fulfill that promise to the people of Israel first and then to the Gentiles. And that's why at the end of this gospel, Jesus will tell his disciples to go to the ends of the earth, go to all the nations and teach them everything I taught them, I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So he's, he will extend it. But first, Israel, to fulfill this promise in Jeremiah and the other prophets, and then to the nations, also to fulfill the prophets. We can take a look at our own circumstances. Cultures have their ups and downs. Sin seems to be promoted from all kinds of places. We live in a time when people you know, are bringing a certain amount of destruction to once very beautiful cities. And we can lament this and say, oh, it's all over. People write to me in emails and such. And they say, oh, it's the end of the world. Just, just get it. No, I don't know that. And neither do you, really. The angels don't know. Our duty is to be faithful to God, knowing that he's more faithful to us, and to seek to do what we can to bring people back, like Jeremiah did in his day, so must we in ours. Let us bring our prayers before the Lord. That our Holy Father and his fellow bishops and priests may instruct the people of God with sincerity and truth. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our For understanding and corroboration between nations, families, and individuals, 
We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. That the sick and suffering may turn to Our Lady, the health of the sick, who intercedes for them to her Son. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For all who have died, that through the passion and death of Christ Jesus, they may be granted the remission of all their sins and share in eternal life. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask that you hear these and all of our needs through Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, and the praise and glory of His name, for our redemption of all His holy church. Graciously sanctify these gifts, O Lord, we pray, and accepting the oblation of this spiritual sacrifice, make of us an eternal offering to you, through Christ our Lord. We'll pray Eucharistic prayer number four with its preface. The Lord be with you. And with Lift up your hearts. And, the Lord. and let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right to give you thanks, truly just to give you glory, Father most holy, for you are the one God living and true existing before all ages and abiding for all eternity, dwelling in unapproachable light. Yet you, who alone are good, the source of life, have made all that is, so that you might fill your creatures with blessings and bring joy to many of them by the glory of your light. And so in your presence are countless hosts of angels who serve you day and night, and gazing upon the glory of your face, glorify you without ceasing. With them too, we confess your name in exultation, giving voice to every creature under heaven as we acclaim.
We give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great, and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You form man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care, so that in serving you alone, the creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death. For you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so loved the world, Father most holy, that in the fullness of time you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life, and that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again for us. He sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits for those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the full. Therefore, O Lord, we pray, May the same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the celebration of the great mystery which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. similar way, taking the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death, his descent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and his ascension to your right hand. And as we await his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood, the sacrifice acceptable to you, which brings salvation to the whole world. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice which you yourself have provided for your church and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one chalice that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, O Lord, remember now all for whom this, we offer this sacrifice, 
especially for your servant, Francis our Pope, Stephen our Bishop, and the whole order of bishops, all the clergy, and those who take part in this offering. Those gathered here before you, your entire people, and all who seek you with a sincere heart. Remember also those who have died in the peace of your Christ and all the dead, whose faith you alone have known. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, and with all your saints, apostles and saints in your kingdom, there with the whole of creation, freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Recepti salutaribus moniti et divina institutione formati audemus dicere. Pater noster, qui es in celi, Sanctifice turnomen tuum, advenia trenum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra, anem nostrum quotidianum, Quaesimus Domine ab omnibus malis, da propitius pacem in diebus nostris, ut ope misericordiae tue adiuti, er peccato simus semper liberi, er ab omni perturbatione securi, expectantes beatam spem, er adventum salvatoris nostri, Jesu Christi. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Pax Domini sit semper vobiscum. Ecum spiritus tuo.
Ce an este? Este cu tole pecată mundi. Beate, cu ce n-am adnivocati sunt. Domnule nostru, Dignus, urice sub tecnul meu, să cantăm de fervă, et să n-am adnivocati. For those who cannot now receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, we offer the following prayer. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within thy wounds, hide me. Suffer me not to be separated from thee. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me, and bid me come to thee, that with thy saints I may praise thee for ever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Accompany with constant protection, O Lord, those you renew with these heavenly gifts, and in your never-failing care for them, make them worthy of eternal redemption through Christ our Lord. Dominus Fobiscum. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Ita Prayer for vocations. God our Father, who wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of your truth, we beg you to send laborers into your harvest and grant them grace to speak your word with all boldness, so that your word may spread and be glorified, and all nations may know you, the only God, and him whom you have sent, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Queen of the Americas, Mary, Mother of the Franciscan Missionaries of the Eternal Word, pray for us.